From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill coming up on today's show. Real solid thread over at Warchant.com. What if? Football, variety, let's force it, shall we? The other football, we've got a national champion. Head coach Brian Penske of the Florida State women's soccer team joins us and recapping a glorious night for the baseball and basketball teams. Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. CPTallyBar.com, the website. If you don't feel like typing, I get it. Go to your phone app. Hit the QR code on your screen. It takes you right to the website. You can check out the daily lunch specials, but I'm going to talk to you about them since you're here, everybody. Wednesday, five-piece chicken wings and french fries. Boom. $8.99. In this economy, five chicken wings and french fries for $8.99. What a flipping bargain. Bill hooking it up. Corner pocket bar and grill. And don't forget, tomorrow, bingo night. 7 o'clock. Test your bingo skills to win drinks and prizes. Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, 2475 Appalachian Parkway in Tallahassee. Warchant.com, your ultimate symbol sports source. Five-star rating review, please. Would appreciate it. Uh, Corey, how are you, friend? You're here, right? I can hear you. I think so. I am here, buddy. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm well. How are you feeling, man? We're, uh, what, four days away? Mm, yeah, well, no. Is when this is Yeah, three days away, right? Oh. It's Wednesday. So, yeah, three days away, buddy. The countdown is 72 hours or so. Countdown is on. I spoke to uh, Steph the other day. She sounds uh, ready to go. Clear minds, full mm. hearts, clear eyes, all that Can't stuff. Lose. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun this weekend. Um, we should do like some sort of we should do like a green screen where like you and Stephanie are next to a green screen. And then we can Photoshop people uh, into like the wedding photo that want to. And like an eight, a glossy eight by ten of Corey oh, on his wedding night, you know. Perfect. Yeah. What that wouldn't that be a great? Uh, great you look. It's never too early to get Christmas gifts, folks, yeah. for your loved ones, and that would be a great Christmas gift as a, a, a photo of me on my wedding day. Well, me and Stephanie, obviously, Stephanie and I. Yeah. All right. Hey, we got to force some football here, Corey. Keep the uh, the the power on here at the Midtown offices and, and such. Like this thread a lot. Uh, biggest what ifs in program history. Need to produce some sort of open for this when we rely on our, our great subscribers over the Tribal Council uh, to produce content for us on the show. Shout out to Noel Daddy the other day for the uh, um, you know unpopular opinion that you want to die on the hill of, about. Uh, the first reply to this one was the best. You know, just what's the, what's the what biggest what ifs in program history? First reply: What if the kicks were good? Mm. Which is like mic drop. Yeah. Uh, somebody posted this one and, and somebody replied, never thought of that one. Uh, Noel for Life says, what if Bobby retires after the 99 championship and Mark Rick takes over as head coach? I, too, have never thought of that one. Oh, I did. About okay. 2006, I was definitely, whenever, <laughs> uh, heck, even 2002, when Rick had turned Georgia into like a top five program. Um, yeah, no, you would definitely, I had thought about that. Um uh, yeah, you know, look, I don't know that Rick was a guy. I think if you keep Mark Rick, it wasn't just that you lost that. It's who he was replaced with, and I'm not trying to speak ill of anyone, especially a family member of the the all time legend of Florida State football. But that was a uh, the, the the program essentially cratered because they had. I don't want to call it incompetence. But certainly they did not have the best offensive coordinator that they could have. And at Florida State in the year 2000 could have literally gone and gotten the best offensive coordinator in the United States, wherever he happened to be. And they they ended up with – so it's not just that you lost Mark Rick. It's who you replaced him with. You you had you, Jeff Bowden and Daryl Dickey. So that was an offer. And so the quarterback play suffered, which meant the offense suffered. And then by the mid-2000s, no, no real big-time – uh, wide receivers are going to want to – Percy Harvin's not coming to Florida State. You know, but if Mark Richt is there, I think it it, it probably, in my opinion, it kind of keeps humming along. Yes. I just think it hums along. I think you don't lose – At minimum. At yes. minimum, it keeps humming along. You have Mark Richt, who, who obviously could uh, uh, coordinate an offense – just look at those 2,000 numbers, uh, 99. Uh, well, every time he was an OC, but also it's Mark Richt and Mickey Andrews. 
Yep. That'd have been that'd have been a pretty nice uh, combo for a few years, and instead it was, you know, I just think it just it was a it was a it was a move that set the program back a, a decade, two three decades really, with with uh, just not just losing him, but then replacing him with. So you know what I'm saying? Like yes. if yes. if that's what it would have taken to keep Mark Richt as your offensive coordinator is to make him head coach, then yeah, in hindsight, it would have been a lot better if he was the head coach. Uh, obviously, uh, some Randy Moss stuff thrown yes, in here, too. That's the all-time number one. <laughs> um, I mean, it is, right? You're yeah. talking about the second best to ever play at a position in the history of football. You're talking about the second best player of all time at wide receiver. And you had him on your roster. He was a part of your program. And instead of getting three years out of him, you got zero. Mm. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, that I think that's the all-time. Bit. I, man, I don't know. The, the, if the kicks were made... Right. That's right. a great one. Yeah. That's a great one. What are you more confident would have resulted in a championship? If the kicks were good or, and this is one that had a lot of people talking on the thread too, if Chris Winkie doesn't injure his neck in 1998. Oh, uh, Winky. If you're talking about just absolute, I'm 100% convinced right, right. That they win a national championship, I think Winky. I, look, man, they almost beat Tennessee with Outson. Who, who essentially was a third-string quarterback because Kendra got hurt before the season. So, Altson was their third-string quarterback in the spring of 98. And then, whatever it is, eight months later, he's playing in the national championship game and completing whatever it was, nine of 29 passes or <laughs> whatever it was. Um, so, no, I think Winky in the Fiesta Bowl, Florida State wins the national championship. I think that's almost a guarantee uh, because they almost won it without him. And the thing with the kicks is – Okay, if you make the kick against Miami, you t- you pro- you tie. It's nineteen nineteen. That's a tie. Yeah. So then, do you get in over Miami and get to play Alabama, or does Miami get in and get to play Alabama? Yeah, right, right. You, it's not a guarantee you would have been in the Sugar Bowl, um, and it's also not a guarantee you would have beaten that Alabama team. That Alabama team was stacked. Although, you know what? Yes, it is, because as as we talked about earlier this week, that ninety two offense at the end of the season was unlike anything college football had ever seen. And Alabama would have been a good would have been the best defense they faced, but Florida State wasn't going to score less than thirty on anyone. Um so I do think, yeah, that if you make the ninety two kick, I think it's a pretty good shot you win the national championship. But if Winky's healthy, I think it's an absolute that you win the national championship. Does that make sense? Yeah. I gotcha. Ninety one who won it in ninety one? It was uh wasn't that Michigan and Washington? Yeah. Split Sounds it. Sounds right. Well, I don't. Did they? I don't think. No. Was it Colorado and what? No. That was no. Colorado 90. Tech was ninety. 90. So yeah, I think it was Michigan and Washington in ninety one. I don't think Michigan had anything to do in nineteen ninety one. Oh no, you're right. I'm sorry. It was Washington and I was thinking in ninety seven. It was Washington and Miami. Yeah. So yes, if you be, I'm assuming yes. If if you be, if you make that kick in ninety one, um, you're not going to lose to Florida two weeks later. And uh, you know who you'll you'll beat Nebraska in the bowl game. Uh, so yes, the, I yeah uh, I still think Winky is the absolute certainty though. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, yeah, uh, Rooster was nine of twenty two. Mm, for sorry, one, Rooster, I gave you seven extra incompletions there <laughs> for one forty five though, man. When he completed them though, man, it was. It was I think uh, I think Dugans had a big game in that one. Like uh, I know Warwick had like one for nine. Dugan's at six for one thirty-five. Yeah, Dugan's they couldn't cover him. They were too busy paying attention to number nine. And then uh I think Outson ran for a few yards too. You 31, know the, 31, yeah. the bigger deal was what what did Travis Minor? What were well, his numbers? Well Outson's longest run was thirty nine. So uh Oh yeah, so then they sacked him. What was what were Miner's numbers? Fifteen for ninety one and netted eighty three yards as long as twenty three. So essentially he ran fifteen times for eighty three yards. Five and a half yards per carry. Maybe give it to him twenty five times. Okay. Maybe okay. that's that was one of my complaints always with Rick is he'd go away from the running game. Uh, you, you needed to you needed to just hammer the ball with Travis Miner, and you might win the game even with a third stringer at quarterback. Uh, my rushing numbers on Rooster were incorrect. Eighteen for fifty three, but he also lost fifty four to sack, so he's netted negative one. Golly, that's that's got to be a national championship game record for yards lost in sacks. Yeah, fifty four. Come on, Jimmy Higgins, tighten up. Man, I wonder if like there was a snap over his head or something that he had to go recover for like a 25-yard loss. That seems outrageous, yeah. 54 yards loss in sacks. Shout out to fan of the program, Keith Cottrell. 
hit a hit a long of sixty, had three inside the twenty. Yeah, man. He hey, he stepped up when it mattered. Big leg. Big and then leg. in ninety nine, he wasn't getting any punts blocked like the Virginia Tech. Uh, schmo that were, you know, are, are having another one run back for a touchdown. That didn't happen on Keith's watch. Uh, so, all right, there we go. There's our football segment for the day. We'll have a Renegade Express mailbag for you folks tomorrow. So jump into the thread over. on. Hey, the- before, just real quick, I did want to touch just briefly on the Norvell contract. Nothing okay. really outrageous yeah, or, um, sure. uh, or, or even all that newsworthy other than I know people care about the buyouts. Um, we talked about it on headlines. Um, if he leaves after this next year, he owes Florida State six million, Woo! and then it and then it goes down every year. It's like four million, three million, two million, two million, one million, and then zero for the last two years yeah. uh, of the contract. And people might raise their eyebrows, saying, "Oh, if he leaves in 2030, he's not going to owe Florida State any money." And just know, folks, if Mike Norvell is still in Tallahassee at 2030, he will have signed a new contract. These will not be the terms he is still coaching under. He will not be coaching the final year of this 10-year contract ever. So the, the he'll, it'll never get to a point where his buyout is zero. But, you know, $2 million in this day and age, which it would be, I think, in three years or Correct. four years, yeah. that's essentially zero. Uh, but it, it's not. It's still $2 million. You can go get yourself a, a nice wide receiver core for that. Um, well, 27 but, I think it would be $2 million. It'd be $2 million. Yeah. So – yeah, look, man, it's it's just the way of the world. I hate it. I've lamented it forever. It's how these contracts are structured. Florida State didn't do anything that no other school do, that doesn't do. But if Mike if Mike Norvell decided to leave tomorrow or got if if he got fired tomorrow or got fired after this next season, he will make he is guaranteed to make eighty million dollars. Right. Yet, if he leaves, he owes Florida State six. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the way of the world. It's dumb. I hate it. It started way long ago. The genie is out of the bottle and cannot be put back in, apparently. Um, but that is just a will, really, really bizarre way that all these presidents and ADs, not picking on Florida State because all these contracts are like this. I liked, I would have liked the buyout to be a little bigger, bigger, but as Ira pointed out, you couldn't really play too much of hardball in that, at that juncture because yeah. Alabama was calling. And you had to make sure that you – keeping Norvell at all costs was the priority. Um, but it does – you know, it is just it's just eye-rolling that $6 million compared to $80 million. Well, so if, if you think about just how much coaching contracts have been inflated, so Jimbo's only penalty was whatever assistant coaches he left behind or like all of his assistants had to be paid. Like if you add up all their contracts, that was still a few million dollars probably – yeah, and that was what six years ago, like and and, and now the penalty is pretty much only is only probably gone up like twenty five percent over that time. Meanwhile, coaching salaries have probably gone up on the top half, uh, yeah. like over forty percent in terms of what they're making year over year. I mean, Jimbo left for like what eight million dollars. Yeah, um, you know now you know eight million is not going to get you anybody of, of consequence. Did you guys did I ever bring this up or ask anybody ask him why is this everything is just amended? Like they they did not tear up the contract. Like everything is still based off like twenty twenty. If you look at it, it as if termination occurs during contract year one, contract year one is still twenty twenty because this is all an amendment to this original contract wow. that he sent. I wonder why they didn't just like rip it up and write a new one from scratch. Maybe they're pressed for time because yeah. Alabama's trying to steal them away. But oh, maybe I'll ask Ira that while you're away and put it into a podcast next week to keep everybody entertained. We'll see how that goes. Uh, Florida State keeping us entertained on a Tuesday night. Uh, let's start with basketball. It's a little fresher in the dome. 90-83 to 83 victory over NC State. Noel shot 60% from the floor. That's crazy. Right? Let's go. Uh, and they're scoring 90 points at will. Um, I haven't watched a lot of basketball this season. Uh, sorry to admit that, everybody. Um, and I'm not the most positive person in the world. That has uh, been proven and shown throughout the course of the six years that we've done this show together. But man, Corey Primo Spears, good ball player. Uh, Jameer well, Watkins, good ball player. Yes. Uh, Baba Miller, there's stuff there. Let's get a little bit uh, more smart with the ball, late game situations. But you like what Baba can be. Man, you bring those guys back, and then you you drop some bait into the transfer portal sees, <laughs> and you, sure. you you pull three guys out of there, and you hit on one of them. That's a good team that can maybe get you out the. I think it's to the tournament for sure next year. I, that's probably too strong of a of a, uh, you know, take, but yeah, 
I think you get another solid player uh, that, that gives you kind of like a Jameer Watkins uh, addition to what you got this past year, and you build on what you have uh, from him and, and from Primo Spears and Baba Miller. I think you have a tournament team, man. So I, I feel good about where they can be next year. We'll, we'll see how the rest of the season shakes out. What did you uh, think about 90 to 83 and that victory on Tuesday night against NC State? Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a good win. Uh, you know, all ACC wins are good. They're now 9 and 8 in the conference, they're ahead of NC State in the standings. Um, you know, ninety to eighty three. It's not your old. It's not your dad's Florida State basketball team. They're they're going to give up points, but they're going to score points. They're one of the better offensive teams in the conference, um, and they give up. I think the most points or second most points in the conference. But they play that style. It's a fun style, ironically. Um, in looking into next year, because what that's really all we can do. Maybe they get hot in Charlotte. They'd have to win four games in a row. That I don't. They, they would have to just shoot unconscious from three to, to win four games in a row. But this league's not that great, though. I don't, it's not, but they're know. not that great. So, right. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, it's not like you're. it's a team that's just underachieved but has all these first-rounders and maybe they'll bring it together. No, they, they're they're not – they're not they have a, they're just not good enough probably to win four games in four days. But it could happen. But when you look at next year, um, yeah, man, you know, Watkins is a – borderline star like he he's just legitimately good he's one of the best players in the conference um he leads them in reboundings he only had three or two on on tuesday night or three but he's he's one of the leading steel guys in the conference he's their leading scorer he's averaging over 15 a game uh he had 19 on on uh on tuesday night and he's just really good at getting the paint and and drawing fouls and making buckets in the paint he's he's good at it he is a good basketball player like a a legitimate all eight, if he comes back next year, um, and I'm not just saying that he would go pro. I mean, the portal is a thing, right? But if Jameer Watkins comes back next year, which you hope he does, he's a legitimate all-ACC first-team candidate. You have one of those guys, you're in good shape. Primo, Primo's more hit and miss. That was the best. I think that was probably the best game he's played, quite honestly. I think NC State had something to do with that. They're not interested in guarding anyone, um, and that's right up Primo's alley. Um, but he, I, he, 14 he's aggressive and, and assertive. I like him, man. I don't well, know. He he's was on, a, but, you know. but he was good that game. Now don't, yeah. let's not act like he's been like that the whole year, but he, he was really good at passing the ball. It lives within, uh, yeah. it lives within him though. That's the thing that lives yes, within correct. him. So yeah. I feel like yeah, Leonard will get got, it out of him. He's got some of that in him. And if he could be more of a willing passer, like he was on Tuesday night, that opens up a lot of things. Uh, for, for this team. Usually when he's making an impact, it's because he's making shots, not because he's distributing and, and facilitating getting other guys' looks. But he had six assists, which I think is a season high for him. And a lot of them were in the second half when he – I mean, those are good passes. Dimes dropped for dunks. Uh, th that's – gets more of that out of him. Um, and Baba, too, continues to grow. He did uh, – you know, look, man, they <laughs> – they had a 12-point lead with like three and a half minutes to go. The game is essentially over. They put Bob in and take give Primo a breather. Watkins misses the and one free throw. Baba, with a 12-point lead with three and a half minutes to go, and the other team in the double bonus, decides to go over the back of a guy for a meaningless def offensive rebound. Like even if you like, you just don't want to foul, dude. Just don't foul. Let let them get the ball. Instead, he fouls. They make two, that that gives them two points. Maybe they only made one, but he gives them two free throws. Um, the next possession, he throws it into the paint to no one. Um, that leads to a break and a layup on the other end because it's a horrible turnover. And then in the final minute, he thinks he can run the baseline and travels with the ball and gives NC State the ball right back. I'm not trying to pick on the kid because he's made great strides and he had seven rebounds in the game. But got to be a little smarter, man. You just got to be a little smarter. You've got If he could come close to his potential next season, to go along with Watkins, Spears, again, assuming they come back. Uh, Chandler Jackson yeah. had a nice game and has had some really good moments this year. Worley is Worley. You've got – I think Bowen has some real upside. But, again, I'm going to stress this again, and we'll be done with it. You've got to shoot the basketball. Mm. You cannot in this day and age – They get. I mean, they got outscored. I know they won the game. They got outscored again by, what is that, 15 points at the three-point line. They've been outscored this year at the three-point line, I think, by close to 200 points overall this season. That's you got to find guys that can shoot. You've got to you got to either these guys got to get better at shooting, or you've got to sprinkle guys in this lineup that can make shots. Um, and you know we'll see if that happens because I don't. If they can't go out and get some elite shooting, if Jameer Watkins had elite shooters on the court with him, he might lead the country in assists. Like he's because he draws so much. 
he's got so much gravitational pull because of how good he is at, in the paint that he's going to draw defenders. And if he can kick it out to guys that can actually knock it down instead of a Jalen Worley, um, yeah, man, they, they have a chance to be an, uh, a really fun team next year. But there's pieces that need to be go to, to be got. But again, look at where they were last year, Aslan. Yes. Horror show. Absolute train wreck. Mm. Just disgusting to watch. No fight. No competitiveness. Get down by 30 almost every game on the road. And then you look at this team. They got 15 wins already. I shouldn't say already. Um, they have 15 <laughs> wins compared to nine last year. And their losses are all close. They're in games. They're competitive. They don't shoot free throws well. They don't shoot the three well. That's cost them a lot. But those are things that you hope you can go recruit it for. I feel like I, I guess I just feel like the DNA has changed a little bit. They don't. They're not okay with getting run off the court like they were the last two years. A lot of that is addition by subtraction with a few players. But they fight. They play hard. They're not great defensively, and they can't shoot. But they play hard. And I do think there's a there, you can see a little a pathway, a pathway where Leonard could go out with an NCAA tournament bid next year. You see a pathway where that could happen. I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to early retire the guy, but right. it's going to happen at some of, one of these years, clearly. He's 75 years old. So, uh, you know, maybe next year is his last year, and if they can get some shooting, th- they have a chance to at least be a 21-10 a twenty-one and 10 type team in like a seven seed. Hmm. That's in there. They have, some, they have some guys that can really play. What if, could Cameron Fletcher? What what if I told you Cameron Fletcher gives you twenty seventeen eighteen Phil Kofer? Yeah, man, that's also a bummer. That yeah. kid had a chance to be something. Like he had a chance to be a Watkins type player. Um, you know, really good athlete, not as good a finisher as Watkins around the rim, but a better shooter. Um, that would have been a nice. I mean, he wasn't going to be a. I don't honestly just watching him earlier this year. I don't think he was going to be all that impactful like we had hoped, because I just don't think he was clearly back from the injury. Um, he wasn't himself athletically. If he could have, if he can, is he even allowed to play? I mean, he's a senior. He, he enrolled in 21 in college. So, I mean, he could use a red shirt, I would think. I assume or, he can be red shirted. Yeah. yeah. So, if he comes back, he gives you a better, he's a shooter. He can actually shoot. Um, and he's a, <laughs> we he's like a, those guys. We like have, those guys in 20, up basketball. He can make baskets. Um, he, yeah, that that would be interesting. You just that's such a wild card, man. That's like his second. Wasn't Phil? I mean, I feel like Phil had some injury problems that we were kind of maybe. Yeah, but Phil wasn't. Phil's sailed. were. I don't know that Phil's were ones that uh, lingered throughout the year. They they weren't ones that he just had to shut it down for the whole year. He might have had one of those, but not two, yeah. and not back to back. Um, it's just hard to imagine that Fletcher will be what he was athletically. But yeah, if he could give you the Phil Kofer final year, Phil Kofer. Um. Yeah, that's no, a second nice addition, final. man. No, no. Eighteen, nineteen. He he played really well that year. Like that that first year, they went to the Sweet Sixteen or whatever, or maybe it was the Elite Eight. They the made? Elite Eight. Yeah, he was their best player in the tournament. Yeah. So. No. Yeah, you're right. He was at least the best player against Michigan, and he was going. It's a bummer, man, because he was gonna be. He was the star of their practices that next year. Hmm. Um, that would have been Terrence Mann's last year. Trent Foy is when they lost to Gonzaga in the Sweet Sixteen. They beat John Morant. Yep. That Phil Kofer in the preseason. The talk you heard from the team was he's unbelievable. He's going to be a first round. Like he was dominating practices. He was an un- he was their best shooter or one of their best shooters. He was a great athlete, good rebounder, block shots, did it all, and then hurt himself. Still played, but battled injuries that whole year. And then his father passed away. Yeah, his father passed away right at the for the first round game, and he didn't play again. So that was a that was a bummer. Yeah. He was a lot more durable than I remembered, so I'm not, I'm not trying to say that he was Mr. Glass. So I apologize, Phil. But yeah, uh, feel good. I feel a little bit better now um, about where the basketball team can be. Because I was like, man, what what are we what are we aiming for? And I I get it, man. They could lose, you know, their next five games and then lose in the conference tournament and then maybe we reassess it. But at least for this moment, I'll hang on to it and feel pretty pretty darn good about it. Yeah, they're things. good. I mean, they they made strides, right? Like yeah. we've all we all know what this thing is now. It's not great. It's it's not even good, but it came from, I mean, literally I kind of equate it. This might be a stretch, but I kind of equate it to the 2021 football season because 2020's football season was disgusting. Like they won three games, but again, they got lucky. I'll keep pointing this out. They didn't have to play Clemson or Florida. They would have given up 70 in each of those games. That was a two and 10, three and nine football team. 
and then the next year they're five and seven, and they're a couple of plays away from being all bowl eligible. Well, you could look at this team and be like, okay, well they're they're couple a few blown sequences. leads, a couple blown yeah. leads away from being in the thick yeah. things. A few sequences away, you know, they they were in the game with North Carolina twice. They were in the game with Duke. They should have beaten Georgia. Like they are close where you could see a path. They're like, yeah, they'd be on the bubble right now. So to go from what they were last year to closest to bubble ish type team. They're not on the bubble, but they're a few breaks away from being on the bubble. That's real progress. And again, the only person they theoretically lose is Darren Green, who has not been much of anything lately as he as he battles this injury and doesn't make a lot of shots. Um, so, you know, you can theoretically bring the whole team back. You don't want to do that. You got to go, like you said, throw some bait into the portal and get some guys that can help you. But yeah, man, the, the, if you can bring this core back, this five or six guys – you feel pretty good about next year. Like, it could be a potential tournament team. And Lord knows we weren't thinking that um, this time last year. Mm. Like, oh, yeah, if, if all these guys come back, they can be a tournament team in 20. Yeah, no. They, they, so they have made some real strides. Speaking of strides, Link Jarrett, baseball team, 6-0 and now after a 12-4 win over a good, I guess, USF team, I would assume. 7-0, Con- and right? Wasn't that their seven? Oh, 7 you're right, correct. My mistake. Come on, man. Don't hey, don't be don't be stealing wins away from Link. He needs he's trying to get to five hundred overall as Florida State head coach. Uh Connor Whitaker, your Sunday starter, usually uh, again with another midweek start, and Ben Barrett soaked up the rest of the innings to get the save. Um uh, we'll see what things look like when they start getting maybe some a little more stiff competition. Again, I think USF's got they've got ball players. Uh this next week yeah. they've got Illinois, Michigan State, Western Michigan. Up in Greenville, those games will be on YouTube, by the way. Not YouTube TV, but like a YouTube channel, I guess, streaming the games. The Greenville Drive, everybody. But um, I don't know, man. Cam Smith, James Tibbs, feel like those guys are going to endure. feel like those are uh, legitimate, high-end, top-flight, elite Division One baseball players. Uh, and they showed out again. Tibbs, two home runs. Uh, Smith yeah. clobbered one as well. Um you know, the bullpen is the bullpen, but hey, man, if, if they can soak up, if they can get six innings out of their starters, I, th- I think they'll be just all right. It'll be tough to hold on to that throughout the season. But just another data point, it feels like that this team uh, is definitely moving in the right direction. Strides uh, will be maintained, I would assume, as the year goes on. Uh, well, yes, and they're not going to be undefeated, gang. I'm going to go ahead and spoil that for you. They are going to lose some games this year. Um, but you're right. Uh, Cam Smith and uh, Tibbs are, I mean, they're, but those are really good bats, man. They're, they're, I mean, early round draft picks, both those guys. Cam Smith, you see, you see all the tools, dude. Like, you, he had four hits in that game. I know two of them were to right field, just stinging line drives to right field. And then he hits a bomb to left center that's like 410 feet. And he's made, in the, the games I've seen, he's made some really nice plays at third base. Yep. He moves well, he throws easy. Um, he's just got all the tools, man. That's why he was the top prospect, considered the top prospect in the Cape Cod League. And he is draft eligible, even though he's a sophomore. So this is probably going to be his last year. It's definitely going to be Tibbs's last year. Um, but yeah, man, those are elite. Those are elite guys. Uh, I think Jaime Ferrer is an elite guy too. He's not off to a great. I mean, I say that he's hitting 345. He's fine. He's not driving the ball yet. Uh, he will though. Um, and what I really like Aslan is. Well, two things. They don't strike out much. They struck out seven times on Tuesday. Uh, they have 37 strikeouts in seven games, which is not much. That's like 5.3 a game. Uh, that's really good, That's especially compared to where they were two years ago, even last year. But remember those teams last two oh. years ago, three years ago? Yeah. They'd have seven strikeouts through the first nine batters. <laughs> I mean, they just they could not put the ball in play. This team does typically put the ball in play. They don't strike out. They have good approaches. Um, and, yeah, and they pick up – so far, they're fielding the ball really well. You know, I, I should go look that up. I don't have their updated stats, but they're fielding at a really high level right now as far as the overall error. So, like, a lot of that has to do with their pitching is so good. There aren't a lot of balls being put in play. But they didn't have an error on Tuesday, um, and they, they only struck out seven times. Meanwhile, your pitcher struck them out 11 times, and that's – they're, they've already struck out their opponents like in seven games, Aslan. They've struck out their opponents like 65 more times. Yeah, they're going into the USF game, their strikeout to walk ratio, which I think is for the pitching side of things. Yeah. Uh, was 60th uh, in the country at 2.51 per game. Yeah, and then in this game, they had 11 Ks and one walk. Yeah. 
That plays. Yep. That absolutely plays. That is a big deal. Again, you know what you have in Whitaker. He's not a, he's not incredible, but he is darn solid. Um, and you also think you have you might have some elite dudes at one and two in your starting rotation. Those guys might be one of the best combos in the country. I'm not going to put it past them. Again, it's been Butler in Western Carolina. So we'll find out a lot more about Leiter and, and Arnold as we go. But you like the top two, and you like Whitaker. You like those three. Everything else is kind of a question. And that's where that's where I think the, the season lies is because uh, these guys aren't – you can't ask your starters to pitch seven innings every game. Your bullpen, there's some of them are going to have bad outings. You also want them fresh in May if you're actually playing for anything. If you plan on playing for anything that matters, you want your starters to be ready to go big innings and a lot of extra games in May and June. Um, so the bullpen has to – it just – you have to find some answers there. And, again, they haven't – not all of them have been awful. You know, Ben Barrett, four, four hits, three innings pitch, three Ks. He's not overpowering, but that's nice that he only walked one. Um, but, yeah, you, you – I. They're going to be better. Clearly, they already are better. The offense, I think, is going to be very good from top to bottom. Ross is a nice leadoff hitter. Um, Lodis isn't even hitting yet. He's not. Come on, Alex. Let's all. go, Bubby. Come on. But when, when he, I mean, there's some pressure, right? The well, he's not the hometown kid, but he's no. he, you know, he's starting shortstop at Florida State, uh, coming in as a reigning conference freshman of the year. Seven games in, he's not looked good, but he will. He, you you have to assume that bat will come around. Yeah. But one through nine, that's a good lineup. The offense will play. I think even in the ACC, they're not going to average twelve runs a game, but they're going to they're going to score runs. It's just a matter of continuing to be solid on defense and then finding out what you got in the bullpen. Because right now you still don't know. But good win, another good win for them. What do you think about them platooning right now at catcher with Jackson West and McGuire Holbrook? Do you want like it? All right. No, I like it. Holbrook can hit, man. Holbrook's Holbrook's the real deal. Um, West had that a big triple, uh, bases loaded triple on on Tuesday. Two out, that, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, was a big one. That was one. a big yeah. hit. That kind of broke it. It made it a went from two zero to five zero yep. real quick. No, but I just think like you know, I think that was probably agreed upon, and it's not like Holbrook's done anything wrong that he wouldn't get to face lefties. Um, I, I like it. I like that they have some options. Um, I don't think either one of them are so much better than the other that they should just be the all time. They're not uh, who Matt Nelson. Yeah, they're not going to just lock it down, but th- those two combined together so far through seven games, I don't know if any team in the country has gotten better production out of catcher. I mean, they're they've been really good. Uh, before the USF game, they were batting second in the country as a team, batting three seventy nine. Uh, their fielding percentage was nine seventy. Corey, yeah, yeah, not bad, my man, not yeah. bad. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Again, they'll be in South Carolina this coming weekend, taking on some uh, random teams. Really Illinois. random. Yeah. Wait, is this a new thing in college baseball? I guess these tournaments where you play a bunch of different teams in one location. Yeah, I mean, I know they they did one that was, I think, where the uh, Rangers play, like yeah. a lot of the top end teams, like like good teams. Yeah. This is not that. This but is not th- that. It's, yeah. it's still a bunch. It's not like you're going to South Carolina to just play College of Charleston. Like you're going yeah. and playing a bunch of. Random schools that are there. It's like a tournament, but not a tournament because it gets them out of the cold weather. I th- I, I wonder if this is something that Link kind of maybe had when he was in Notre Dame, and, and maybe Notre Dame was like, "Yeah, oh, we won't do." It. And he's like, "Oh well, I'll we'll fill in for them then." Um, but yeah, just get some of these northern teams in, into the sunny mm. uh, South and, and get them playing some games. So um, that's how it looks like. All right, Corey, uh, you want to tee up uh, the? Actually, no. Let me talk about Vitamin Energy first. VitaminEnergy.com, everybody. I did forget because I don't have the Focus Plus in me. Mm. Um, I have sent. Vitamenergy.com, promo code is WordChamp BOGO, WordChamp B-O-G-O. Use that promo code, buy one item, get one of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. Uh, that's how much they believe in it because they know you'll be back because there's no money to be made when you're giving stuff away for free, but they get you on the comeback because you're like, wow, this stuff's actually really good. Uh, it, it was clinically tested and clinically proven. I believe Aslan after all this time now. Uh, shake it and take it. Try it, you'll like it. Uh, again, Workout Plus, personal favorite of the podcast here, the Sour Apple flavor, right, Core, Just delicioso. Uh, the Mood Plus, also a great one that we like. Focus Plus. You can try the Variety Pack if you don't know exactly which one you want to try. That's the beauty about the Variety Pack and the promo code. Go to Viamergy.com. Noel's behind this entire enterprise, making it happen for you with that promo code WarChampBogo. First and only clinically proven, clinically tested energy shot. Vitaminenergy.com, shake it and take it. Okay, Corey. By uh, the way, our contact, I, I feel weird. We're not allowed to say their names. We don't want to say their names. Right. 
But our vitamin energy guys, our athletes, our, our people that have the connections to Florida State, uh, he emailed me and, uh, and congratulated me on the wedding. Nice. That was nice. He's yeah. a good guy. He's a I good think dude. he was reaching out for an invite. <laughs> Ain't happening, baby. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That was very nice that he uh, uh, that he did that. And we should uh, we should have some vitamin energy. Can you bring some vitamin energy? Why not? Yeah, absolutely, man. Bring some. I know you have pallets of it. Bring some. I'll bring a box. You bring a box to the wedding. You want me to? All right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. All right. I will do. I will do that. Well, I, I think people might need some some focus at the end of that at the end of that night. I think there's one that actually helps with hydration. I guess maybe like it helps you absorb stuff. I'll Boom. I'll bring that. Yeah. Yeah. There we, there go. we go. Now we're talking. There's a vitamin energy for every occasion. Everybody, it's a beautiful thing. All right. So this week, you know, again, I, we're gonna try maybe do a live show one week have a feature interview one week and then the next week do like a, a mailbag this week. We're going to do an interview and a mailbag mailbag tomorrow interview today. Corey's been wanting to do this one for a while. Uh, and I was like, ah, all right, sure. I guess. I mean, no offense, I mean, you know, great accomplishment, uh, what he's done in his short time here in Tallahassee. Uh, and we're not going to talk a lot about soccer. I promise you. Uh, but we do have the head coach from the Florida state women's soccer team. That's fresh off a national title. Brian Penske, I love it, Corey. I think he's an awesome dude. Those are yeah. uh, really revealing uh, answers. Uh, no no coach speak at all. Um, anything else you want to add before we rip the interview? It was like 30 minutes worth. Uh, no, no. I, I It was really insightful. He did, He's uh, That's the first time I've ever talked to him, I think. And he, he was really like an open and honest. Talked about Kerkorian and taking over for him and mm -hmm when he did it in his life. And it's really cool. Like I, number one, I didn't know he was that old. He doesn't look that old and he's not, look, I, I'm certainly in no position to call somebody in their mid fifties old, but I thought he was in like his, I don't know why. I just thought he was in his early forties, but for him to make that kind of jump, I think he said when he was 53 to a 53 or 54 to make a jump, to replace a legend like that, uh, took a lot of cojones. As he said, one of his, as you'll listen, guys, the, he, most of the people in his life, when he was presented that opportunity, weren't for him taking it. Hmm. Told him, it sounded like they all told him, this is not a good idea. You don't want to be the guy that follows. And then all he did was have one of the best soccer seasons in the history of the sport, not just the history of the school, the history of college women's soccer. That was one of the best teams of all time. And I did want to explain, I, try, I think we did in the interview itself, but it would have made a lot of sense to have him on the week after they won the national championship, right? Correct. Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. But – Something kind of big had happened in Florida State sports the Sunday before his team won a national championship, and that was your football team being left out of a playoff, even though they were undefeated. So that dominated our time, and it, it just felt like it wouldn't have been right to bring in a so – like, let's celebrate the soccer team when we're all still so mad and, and you know, hurling F-bombs at Herb Street to then be like, hey, well, let's bring in – but we probably shouldn't have waited three months either. But uh, we talk about that. We talk about their mindset after – being on the like being on the bus when that happened on Sunday before their national championship game. Anyway, I just thought it was all really revealing. It was a, it was a good interview. But w you and I, you and I do good interviews, Aslan. Try to. Don't you think? Sure. Yeah, man. That's why people like the interviews. Again, it's not easy to book these things. If we could yeah. book these things like a slam dunk, we'd have one every single show. But alas, it does not work like that. Hey, shout out real quick before we go to that. Uh, Brady Clark, his team lost on Tuesday night, five to four. Tough JV game, mm. uh, but he did, and he didn't do well at the plate. But he did make the catch of his life in center field, uh, robbing a kid of at least a double. Let's go! Like, like straight out, parallel to the ground, diving to his left, hauling it in as he hit the ground. Just an unbelievable. Just he's a he's a good outfielder. That's the thing he probably does the best. Uh, but man, that was the best catch of his life. That was uh, that was really nice. And then he he screwed it up because he could have gotten the, he could have doubled off the kid at first, and instead he threw the ball. He tried to throw it to the second baseman really quickly, and he threw it past them, so they couldn't double the kid off at first. But it was still best catch of his life, and that made watching him not struggle at the plate a little bit worthwhile. Uh, see, I wish mom was there because I think mom would have I think mom would have taped it. No, mom was there, but it's hard to you don't record right. a whole baseball game, and you never know when the we I'll record his at bat sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when you're in the field, it's like I don't. When do we know the ball? He's gone games where the balls aren't hit to him at all. Yeah. So it's hard to record everything. I wish I had recorded that one though, because that was a that was a keeper. All right. What 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 were the two teams playing? Maybe we can make a, a a cattle call out there to anybody that was out at that ballpark. Like, hey, if you're filming that game by chance. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, Brookwood and Mill Creek JV. Okay. By the way, Brookwood. Cool it with the varsity pitchers playing in JV games, gang. That wasn't fun. Nobody wanted to see that. Good grief, that program has some arms. 
All right, here we go. Brian Penske, head coach of the Florida State women's soccer team, defending national champs with Corey Clark and myself. Trying to branch out, everybody. Well-deserved interview opportunity here for us. The pride of the Potomac, Brian Penske, head coach of the defending national champion Florida State Seminole women's soccer program, joining us here on the show. Coach, trust you're doing well. Uh, first question I want to ask you out the gate. I'm sure as a coach, you're so eager for the next season to start year after year. This one, do you want this offseason maybe to go a little bit slower so you can kind of enjoy what you accomplished this past season? Uh, 100%. Um, I would say uh, thoughts as it relates to next season are um, just making sure we're, we're, we're ready to compete for another national championship. Um, if we could slow that down and have that happen a year and a half from now as opposed to a half a year from now, uh, you nailed it, uh, 100%. Brian, I've, I said this after you guys beat Stanford. Uh, you could make an argument. I don't know, obviously, uh, 1% of the amount of soccer you do, and I don't have a, a real, I don't know, a real basis for this other than could you make the statement in the, could you have the opinion that your 2023 soccer team was the best college soccer team of all time or at least had the best season? of any college soccer team of all time? Uh, I think um, unequivocally, you know, uh, at least in the quote unquote modern era, right? right? There, there were some Carolina teams back in the nineties, eighties and nineties with the Mia hams and that whole crew, right. That, that, you know, were pretty good. Had some, had some players that achieved a lot of things, but in the, in the last 15 to 20 years, um, there, there haven't been many undefeated teams. I think Stanford's 2010 team might have gone 25-0-1, and they were, they were obviously pretty good. Um, but to, to, to be undefeated um, in a league with yeah. four teams in the Elite Eight um, um, and then Stanford coming into the league, um, if you count them, that's five teams in the Elite Eight, but we still we had to play them. And obviously they were a team that had only given up 10 goals on the season right. hadn't given up more than one in any game. Um, we, we were, we were a very good team and I think, uh, we were talented. Um, I think we played an attractive style and, uh, um, we were attacking and fun to watch. And so I think, uh, you know, they talk about that all the time in every sport, right? Who, who, who wins, you know, LeBron's best team versus Michael's best team and so on. Um, but I think I think uh, we've got a pretty good argument for ourselves. Well, I want to remind people because it's been a couple of months since the season. And you guys, I, I feel like 22-0-1 was the final record. Um, I just looked it up. You played 11 teams ranked in the top 20. I believe nine of them or eight of them were top 10. Um, it's not like you went to an undefeated record playing in like a so-so conference. I mean, you were playing very good teams. That's what I think to me stands out. Like I get those North Carolina teams had hall like great players, Hall of Fame type players, but the competition just Different across world. the country, it wasn't even close to what you guys went through. It's the equivalent to me of a men's college basketball team going undefeated. It just doesn't happen anymore because of the parity. So for you guys to do it is just unbelievable. It's pretty impressive. And and some of those games that you're talking about and some of those teams were very good teams that we had to beat repeatedly. You know, we, yeah. had, we, had, we had to beat Pitt three times, um, you know, the third time in the Elite Eight. Um, we had to beat them also in the ACC tournament, so games that mattered. And then we had to beat Clemson three times, uh, the second time being in the ACC final, and then the, the, the third time being in the national semifinal. Yeah, the final then, four, yeah. Yeah, you know, and then, and then, and then had to beat Stanford. So – um, look, no argument from me here on right. all the all the amazing points you're making. Um, at the end of the day, and this is how we want to recruit, and this is how we want to play. Um, it's oftentimes about attacking players and making teams uncomfortable, right? Um, how we defended down the stretch and our defending got a whole lot better, and we had some and continue to have a lot of tremendous talent, right, in, in the back half of our team. However, um, games are won, right? They, they say defense wins championships and defense matters, right? But, uh, you know, I reference LeBron. I re reference Michael Jordan. You know, you talk about the Tom Brady's. You talk about 
Patrick Mahomes. It's every sport, right? Who are, who are the who are the killers, right? Who are the players that can change and win games? And we had not just one or two. We had five or six players that could really um, impose their will on teams, and that's that's hard to stop. I don't think you necessarily wanted to remake this program, Coach Penske, but. In some ways, you have. I mean, you, just the fact that you know the amount of goals, the offensive output has been so significantly different than, than years prior. I mean, was that was that a concerted effort, and what, was that something that was a resistant idea at first, or how much of that was instantly embraced because it is a more attacking style and more exciting brand of of soccer? Yeah, good question. I think it's evolved over the the two years that I've been here. Um, certainly, didn't come in here um, looking to change anything. Right. I just wanted to <laughs> we kept the status quo that meant we that meant we would continue to win championships. You know, um, we made one tweak kind of defensively in my first year. And that was just because of our, our lack of depth in, in one area of our team and kind of had to sell that to the players a little bit. Not ex not sell it, but explain it to them. And they understood that. Um, um, but, you know, some of some of the prior staff's M.O. has been let's keep the ball a lot and keep it in the back half and fatigue the other teams attacking players so that they would not have the legs to attack. And I like that, right? That's, that's not a philosophy that I've ever um, tried to kind of bring to a team. Um, but that was a little bit of their, their MO. Let's just pass it, pass it, pass it, tire out the attacking players and they won't have any juice going forward. I think what what this team like to do, and, and it's kind of my makeup as a coach, is let's attack so relentlessly that their back five, that their 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 defensive players are going to be so tired that they can't defend. <laughs> you know, and really that was the story of our season because we played 23 games. I think 12 or 13 of them, we were tied um and then one of them we were behind at halftime. And so teams could stay with us for 45 minutes, maybe 60 minutes, but they would eventually fatigue because our attack was so relentless. And so I think that's just kind of, um, you know, how we like to build teams um, and how we like to play. And, um, um, you know, maybe it leaves their attacking players a little bit more fresh. I don't know, but it certainly leaves their back players um um, really tired. And we talk about, we talked about this in the national championship game. Can we get them, their, their back players to want to tap out? And, uh, I think we, we, we put those players in a, in a, in a, in a, um, in a pretty tough predicament in that game. They, you mentioned that Stanford had given up 10 goals all season. You guys scored five, which is, it's, it's like a, again, it's like a baseball team that has an ERA of one going into the college world series. And some team puts 26 on them. Just uh, that's a crazy number for a women's championship uh, soccer. And then also you guys outscored opponents in the second half to that point. I just looked it up 53 to five mm -hmm. in the second half of games. Again, you're not playing in the mountain West, man. You're playing in the, the preeminent yes. conference in the country. Correct. That, that, so that is obviously a lot of talent. The talent yeah. helps. That's the most important thing. Any coach will admit to that talent acquisition, but that that game plan, like, did is that something you in August or July? You're like, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna attack. So th this is our game plan. This is how we can beat teams. Is that was that the plan in July, or did it kind of come together as the season went on? I think it was an evolution for sure. Yeah. You know, because you never know going in any season, right? We we lost three very good players from one year ago. Two attacking midfielders who you know, had won a lot of championships here. And so who's going to fill their shoes? How are the new players going to assimilate and things like that? So it was a work in progress. And to be honest, I think one of the keys to our team was our players not thinking they were very good. Our players, like we, we and and apologies for anyone that's heard me say this before, but, but you know, it's so true. And it, it, it I think it really defined us as a team. Eight or nine or 10 games into the season, we beat Miami here. Um, we were number two or three in the country. We beat Miami here two nothing. Um, and we, I think we are number two in the country, number one in the ACC. 
And the next morning at the video session, um, our, 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 our video session was a morgue. Like our team thought, like they genuinely thought we stunk. They thought they played terrible the night before. We should beat Miami more than two nothing. And it's, and literally, they weren't believing a word I was saying. I was trying to tell them how good we were and showed them good clips and this and that. It wasn't until about a week or two after that where we beat Notre Dame four to one. And Notre Dame was a is a very good team, very good program. We played them in the ACC semifinals last year, and uh, we beat them four to one. And then our team finally believed. You know what? Actually, we're actually not that bad, and we could actually maybe do something special. And so we always had the talent. Um, we always had the drive, but I don't know that they really believed because, again, they're a new team, right? New right. team and Phil Nicewanger and Claire Robbins and Heather Payne Shoes. And so it was then all of a sudden they got a little bit of confidence behind them and had the drive still and then the talent. And I think from that point on, we might have outscored our opponents like 38 to three down right. the stretch, um, which, again, that speaks to, again, a bit of a humility and a hunger and just uh, a want to not let this program down, right? We, they stare all, all, every day at training and games at, at the history of the program and the college cups and the national championships. And it was this year's team. It was their team. And so what are they going to make of themselves? And because of all those reasons, they've left a pretty good legacy. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned it, humility, hunger, belief, I feel like you need to have all three of those to have taken the the jump that you made, Coach Penske, from from Tennessee to taking this Florida State job. When the contact started happening between the university and yourself, and you're texting your friends in the sort of coaching fraternity and, and the soccer community, was it you're crazy for thinking about this, or was it Brian? You got to take this job. Oh, there was no Brian. You got to take this job. Um, <laughs> you know, one one text I got from an old coaching friend was literally wasn't like, Hey man, it wasn't, you know, congrats. It was just literally these were verbatim, the words, do you really need this in your life? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I sat there like speechless for a minute or two, like, Whoa, is he onto something? Right. Um, but I, but it was actually the opposite. Like I, I needed it in my life. Right. I, I, kind of needed my engine restarted, right? Um, I wanted another challenge. Um, I was ready for something different. And, uh, you know, when I when I changed from Maryland to Tennessee, Maryland was home. And that was a big, big leave, big departure, right? We were still in the ACC. We had finished top 10 in the country the last three years. We had it rolling. But you know, I don't think Maryland was about to cut sports. They were about to yeah. cut sports. Then it, eventually they went to the Big Ten because of finances. And so they didn't really care a whole lot about their soccer program. Dave Hart, who obviously was here for a while, um, was at Tennessee. And he hired me at Tennessee. And Mark Krikorian, um is who introduced me to him at Tennessee. And they wanted me really badly. And I kind of was like, yeah, let's let's go for it. Need a new challenge, all those things. And then, and then this was obviously the biggest challenge in my professional career. And I came here knowing I might fail, right? I might fail, but you know what? Screw it. I'm 50, at the time I was 53. I'm going to go for this. I'm going to, if nothing else, I'm going to send a message to my kids who are all, who are 18 and 20 at the time. You know what? In life, you, you got to go for stuff, right? And I'd had a, a, a parent of a player tell me back in 2015, who was a, very wealthy man who owned an NWSL professional soccer team for a while. He said every great success he had in his business life was from taking great risk. And I remember that stuck with me. And then, you know, seven years later that I took this job. And um, I, honestly, I never, I never fathomed winning a national championship and whether that is, you know, having low standards for yourself or not. I don't know. I didn't think it's realistic, right? It's not easy, right? I think only 13 or 14 coaches have won national championships. So I never dreamt of being here. Um, but then when I thought about taking this job, I was like, you know what? Maybe a national championship is within reach. And uh, so made the choice to go for it. And um, obviously happy that I did. Did you, when you got to Florida State, now, you know, I, I guess I guess players can leave 
well, they can leave whenever they want, however they want now, and they could then too. You know, they they came to play for somebody else. They came to play for a legend, in a in, in a legend in the sport, a legend at Florida State. I mean, one of the all time greats. And then, kind of a not kind of completely abruptly, he leaves. You come in, and it's not like you have to pick up the pieces. There's still a lot of pride. It's still a great program, but do you have you have to sell yourself, and you have yeah. to sell your vision because. I don't know how many of those girls even knew who you were. I mean, you were at Tennessee, you're at a big school, but probably not a ton of them. No, so how did that go? How how did you go selling yourself? I don't know how many people you had leave. I know it wasn't many um, to stay in the yep. program and believe in your vision and what you could do. Yep. Well, uh, there were when I got here, there were nine play. There were twenty about twenty five on the roster, and uh, only nine of them were not in the transfer portal. <laughs> Right. right. So the rest were in the transfer portal. So um, back to what you were saying um, in, in, at the start of that was they came to play for Mark and then abruptly he was gone one day. And so honestly, I, I only and I felt terribly for them when yeah. it happened. Right. Um, and uh, so so when I got in the room to meet with them for the first time in late that late April, I just said to them, I'm like, I'm sorry for what you guys have gone through. Right. And, and I really meant it. And I, I just, I was like, I, I can understand the range of emotions that you're feeling. And the last thing you want to be seeing right now is me at the front of this room. And I get that, right. This is, this is, this is tough. Um, and, I said, you guys are the national champions. You're the ACC champions. This is your team. This is not my team. And I, I need your help, right? And uh, um, hopefully we can learn a little bit from each other and hopefully we can try to do this together. And, and so fast forward, that was like April 25th-ish. Fast forward about June 15th, we had gotten uh, 20 players on our team. Uh, five of them left. Uh, two, um, went perfect, went, decided to go pro, um, and then three transferred to other schools and then whatever it was, 11, uh, came out of the portal. And, um, and then we got one player to transfer in for Mississippi state. So we had 21 players in the fall of 22. Do you allow yourself, this isn't normal. Like, you know, what you did, what you've accomplished here in such a short amount of time, where again, Mark Corian's an all-time great coach, and Florida State was the best program in the country when you took over for it. But there's no guarantee it stays there. You know what I mean? And, and like you said, especially in this day and age with the portal, for you then to put together, we just talked about it, not the best team in school history, maybe the best team of all time in the history of the sport, must feel so rewarding uh, for you, I would imagine. Because usually when a team when a team loses a legend like that, a head coaching legend, they hire from within, you, you know, it's not like, and it's not so abrupt. This was, this was like, I don't even, I can't even equate it to anything like Bill Belichick leaving after one of the Super Bowls and then them going and hiring John Gruden. And he puts together even a better team than Bill Belichick had. Like what you did is pretty remarkable and kind of unheard of. Can you allow yourself to appreciate the heights, not that just the Florida state program reach, but that you helped them reach. Well, I, I really appreciate that. And, and honestly, when you say that, it does, it gives me a moment of thinking about that. It gives me a little bit of perspective of what we have done. Um, but I haven't thought about it a whole lot because I'm so worried about next year. Right. Um, you know, uh, it never just, ends with you guys. It, it never, never it, ends with you. Dudes. It just doesn't, it doesn't, you know, and as soon as you're not worried about next year, it's over. Right. And it's over and, and your, your decline begins. Right. Um, so that's the standard here. Um, but, uh, you know, one day, obviously, when we retire and move on and we're going to look back and probably be pretty proud of what we've done um, for sure. Um, you know, you've referenced Mark a lot and justifiably so I uh, leaned on him um, big time for the last year and a half. And he's been amazing uh, with me. I have called him and ask for help. I've bounced things off of him. Um, he's been a, a, a just priceless resource for me in any and every way and uh, um, endless appreciative of him. And, and, and I told him this that night after the, we won, 
I literally, the first time I looked at my phone, we walked off the field like an hour, hour and a half after the game. I think I had like 354 text messages. And literally the only one that I wanted to, uh, the, the only one that I did respond to, I think until the next morning was to Mark's, right? Because uh, I was so appreciative and grateful for all that he did. MyBookie.ag promo code is WarChant. Use that, get an instant cash deposit bonus over at MyBookie.ag. Disrespect, everybody. Lots of disrespect coming the Knowles way, looking at things here for next season. Clemson has drawn even with Florida State at plus 2,000 to win the national title this upcoming season. All right? More disrespect. DJ Uwe Ungalale was... Plus 2,900 to win the Heisman. He's now plus 3,100. Cam Ward was plus 2,400. He's now plus 2,200. What's the deal? What's going on over there in Antigua, my bookie? What's up with these lines? Anyhow, better value, though. Better value. Let's look at it that way. Let's, let, let's look at it through that prism of hope, optimism, and good vibes. WarChant promo requires $50 minimum deposit and rollover requirement. A one-time deposit total, including bonus for withdrawal for full terms and conditions. Visit mybookie.ag slash about dash us. I just got one last tangential question, uh, Coach. You know, In this day and age, coaching counterparts in other sports uh, need absolutely every single possible resource available to mankind to win games in their sport. And if, and if they don't get that, uh, somehow you've let them down. You came from a conference that was flush with cash from a university that supported all their sports programs. And I'm sure you probably had more resources in in Knoxville than maybe you had in in Tallahassee, yet you were able to achieve your your crowning accomplishment, your coaching career in Tallahassee for a program in the ACC. Can you contextualize what resources are uh, for a head coach coaching an Olympic sport or a non-revenue generating sport? And I'm not saying that you don't want everything you possibly could get, uh, but but how are you able to to make the most of what you had in, in Tallahassee despite maybe not having uh, everything imaginable. Great question. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it starts with players, right? It is, that's, that's what you have to have, right? You have to have um, a, an amazing staff who's willing to work and grind and all of that. But, and I, I say this all the time, Gino Ariema, right? He, this is my favorite quotation ever, right? Um, and I heard it 10, 12 years ago, two types of coaches, Coaches of great players and ex-coaches, right? And so (laughs) no matter what, right? No matter what, you got to find a way to find the players, right? And doesn't matter all the facilities and the bells and whistles and all this stuff. You can have all of that stuff. But if you don't have the Jimmys and the Joes, doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Nothing matters but the players. And I go back to my time at Maryland. Our budget at Maryland, our recruiting budget was $16,000, $16,000, right? And um, we got to be top 10 in the country, right? And uh, we had some very successful teams and we had some success a couple times against Florida State. And it's just because we are, we recruited our tails off and we got good players and we were able to win, right? Our travel budget was terrible, right? But didn't matter, right? We just grind it, right? And uh we had no support staff. We had no director of ops, right? We had three coaches and, and, and that was it. So, um, you know, the resources matter. Okay. They do, but bottom line is what are your players? And then what services are you providing to your players, right? What's the information you're giving to your players? Are you credible as a coach and as a human being to your players to where you're going to now get the most out of them? That's everything right? That is at its core, right? We can, we can have everything, but if, if they're not picking up what we're putting down, so to speak, that's pretty cheesy, but it's true. And like when I got here, if all of a sudden I, and I was, I was timid, I was terrified. I was, they had been listening to Mark Krikorian day in and day out. That's why they came here. Right. And so I had to be buttoned up every single time I stood in front of that team, I was being analyzed and and critiqued and all of it and so we had to make sure that we knew what we were talking about every single time in that first meeting i referenced before you know back in you know april of 22 they grilled me right they they about a third of them probably knew who i was because i tried recruiting them and then uh, a bunch of them didn't but they knew i was from the sec and the sec 
in the ACC doesn't have a great reputation for right. soccer. And Mark always played a very attractive style of soccer. So they were grilling me, right? How are we going to play? What is What do your teams play like? Are we going to pass the ball? All of those things. And another reason why we won our team this past year and the year before, a bunch of alpha females. These women are not afraid of anything, right? And so they, if they felt like they needed to and wanted to come at me, they were coming at me, right? And, uh, you know, I took it like a champ and we just talked things out and we're able to move forward. And yeah, it worked out really well. My last question was about who I think is one of those alpha females. Uh, you had one of the best freshmen in the United States, maybe one of the best freshmen any of us have ever seen. Can you talk us through the recruitment of Jordan Dudley? And, and um, was she committed before you took the job? She was. Yeah. And yep. How, that, talk about re-recruiting people. Like she she committed to somebody else. How did you keep her on board? And did you expect quite what we, you knew she was talented? Obviously, did you expect quite what we saw in her first year at Florida State? Yeah, I mean, she is uh, she's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde, right? Very quiet, shy. Um, off the field and then an absolute monster on yeah. the field. Right. Thankfully I did try to recruit her a couple years ago when I was at Tennessee. So there was a little bit of a relationship there. Um, you know, one of my first drives was to Atlanta to meet with her and her parents. And, uh, you know, that went pretty well. I think she really liked Florida state. We might've gotten a little bit lucky. Um, her dad's family is from Albany, right. An hour up the road. Right. And so, as my dad told me years ago, right? You got to be good and you got to be lucky in life, right? And so maybe that was a thing that kind of kept her here as well. Um, and then she was connected with to her, to her classmates and things like that. And then uh, one thing where I think she might have had a little bit of respect for me was she was she always played as a forward, but wide. And I told her when I was recruiting her at Tennessee, I told her I thought she could be pretty good up top, centrally, right? Closer to goal, in front of goal. And, and I told her club coach that a year ago, he put her up top centrally in her last year of club soccer and she tore it up and she got broke into the U 20 national team. And her club coach also felt like I could be good for her. And her club coach told her that and, and the way that my teams like to play. So I think I had all of that going for me, but the first part of this season, she played for us wide because we had a center forward in Beata Olsen who, uh, who, if you look up alpha female, you yeah. know, alpha, you know, she, 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 she will She's slit the my picture. throat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Right. And so Beata was playing as our center forward. And then against uh, North Carolina, we played those two together up top because tactical change and things like that. And that was a little bit of Jordan Dudley's coming out party, two goals against North Carolina. Unbelievable. And then we went back to our four, three, three. We had to co have a conversation with Beata Beata was going to go now go wide. Jordan was going to stay central. Beata took it like a champ and played some of her best soccer down the stretch. So, again, that's amazing resilience and acceptance from Beata and allowed Jordan to do her thing. And, uh, I mean, again, you talk about humility. Jordan has no idea how good she can be, right? She was half, half the year her whole life she was playing basketball, right? My first right. summer here, I got a text from Brooke Wyckoff saying, are you, is, is Jordan Dudley really coming here to, to, to Florida State to play soccer? Because I'm at an AAU tournament in Indianapolis now watching her play basketball, and she is tearing it up, mm. right? So this is the first time in Jordan Dudley's, you know, post-pubescent life, excuse those words, right, where she's not playing, not a two-sport athlete, and just com committing her whole life to playing soccer. And she, as we speak right now, she is in Bogota, Colombia with the U-20 national team. Um, and ha had she declared for the NWSL draft in the wintertime, she would have been the number one pick in the NWSL draft. So um, she's big time. We're lucky to have her. Simple good job. Hey, good job bringing her to Tallahassee, man. Good work. <laughs> I, I did have one more thing that I wanted to talk to you about because we've talked about having you on the show now for a couple of months, and we really wanted to do it the week you won the national championship, clearly, but something obviously seismic had happened in Florida State sports the day before you guys won a national championship. And I wondered, did I, I don't know if you talked to your team about that. Obviously, they saw the selection show. They knew they know how important football is to the to the university, and they know how just crestfallen and angry all Florida State sports fans were. 
did playing that next night for a national championship, did it not add pressure, but add anything to the pregame speech or just their their feeling or motivation going into that going into that game? Did it affect them at all? Yeah, you know, um, we were on the Sunday of the you know the 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 announcement of the college the final four college football playoffs. We practice at like ten thirty a.m. and we're on the bus driving back at noon while during that. The, the announcement and everybody was on the bus. We didn't have satellite TV on the bus. So everybody's watching on their phones and here we are waiting for, you know, the fourth team and the Alabama logo goes up and everybody's phone is kind of in a different place, right. In terms of, you know, the speed and when, right. when they're getting the information, but all of a sudden you start hearing cuss words flying out. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then just a dead silence. Right. And so our, our, our players and our staff, right they're all in for Florida state and they were pissed. We were all pissed. Right. And, and they're connected. The players are connected to the players, coaches to coaches, train athletic trainers to athletic trainers. So we feel for all those people. Right. And so I think it was almost a little bit unspoken. And then the next day, national championship day, we're staying right in downtown Raleigh and you know, whatever we're walking around and just kind of hanging out outside, just finding ways to kill the day. And we have Florida state stuff on and just random people are walking past us and they're like, you guys got hosed, you got screwed. Right. And so we're like, we know, you know, so, so I think they knew, I think I didn't say anything. Right. I did say something in the bus on the, you know, to our team in the bus back um, afterwards, right. To our team, but they knew going in and so many people, talked about it afterwards, how it didn't make up for Sunday. Right. And it didn't make up. I mean, it's, that's a forever decision. I'm but it was a boost, man. It was right? a needed boost to the, just the psyche of the it was Florida a State bit fans. of a pick me up. No yeah. question. And we felt that from the whole Florida state community. And that was, that was pretty special for our players. Well, Brian, just all you need to do now is have a better year in 2024 than you did in 2023. You can't. Hey, don't rest on your laurels, man. You got it. Go you have it. Go go undefeated without a tie this time. Exactly. Ties. No question. <laughs> no question. Tell By the it. way, didn't that tie? Didn't you tie it with like 20 seconds to go against Carolina? Uh, was it how that went? Two seconds. Two seconds. That's right. It was almost like a buzzer beater. We got a corner kick with 15 seconds left, and uh, and I think the score sheet says seven seconds, but literally. There were two seconds on the clock for the because they still had to kick the ball off for mm. uh yeah, two seconds left against Carolina. It was beautiful. Well, that's what beautiful. a tie definitely feels like a win. One hundred percent. And uh equally um enjoyable for Carolina, that's when a tie feels like a loss. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Brian Penske, head coach of the defending national champion Florida State women's soccer program. Coach, thanks so much for taking time out. We really appreciate it. Enjoy this offseason. May go as slow as possible. All right, guys. Thanks so much for having me on. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. That is a wrap for today in this edition of Wake Up or Chant, presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Thanks so much to head coach Brian Penske for hopping on the pod and talking with Corey and I. You can see the whole video if you want. If you watch the YouTube version of the show, go check it out, perhaps. We're going to do a mailbag, everybody. Mailbag on Thursday for you folks tomorrow. So... If it's like, you know, before one in the afternoon, hustle over to Warchant.com's Tribal Council, post your question in the thread that's pinned to the top of the Tribal Council, and we'll probably talk about it. Yeah, and that'll be the last show that we'll do as Corey not being a wedded man. Amazing, right? We made it this far. Look at that. All right, that's a wrap for us. Thanks so much for listening. I think Jeff's back today. I think. 1 to 3 o'clock. If not, just go to Warchant.com and hang out. We're all there doing cool things. For Corey, I'm Aslan. Thank you for listening and watching the Wake Up Warchant presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.